Welcome to the Doctrine Matters Podcast, where we seek to equip the church to understand and live out its faith. I'm your host, Stephen Dew. I'm the preaching pastor at South Caraway Baptist Church in Jonesboro, Arkansas. We want to thank you for joining us today, and let's get right to today's episode. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this Friday edition of the Doctrine Matters podcast. This is a special edition that I want to put out today because I've got a lot of things on my mind, and a lot of things on my mind are the way our world is right now. But the most important thing that is sitting at the forefront of my mind is depression. Now, there's these commercials that have been out there in years past that say, Who does depression hurt? Where does depression hurt? And the fact of the matter is, depression hurts. I don't know if you or anybody you may know struggles with depression, but out of transparency, I will tell you that there are times where I do struggle with depression myself, and it is not something that I wish on anybody. It is a lonesome feeling. It is a crushing weight sometimes, and a lot of times I find that as a result of being a pastor that there are so many demands and there's weight of being a pastor. There's times where I don't feel like I'm doing enough as a pastor. There's times where I feel like I'm doing too much as a pastor. I'm neglecting my kids. I'm neglecting my church. I'm neglecting my family overall. There's just so many things that go along with pastoring. And then you get the criticism. You get all of the things that go with being a pastor, but you also do get the encouragement. You get the ones that are praying for you. You do uh, have those things, but being a pastor is tough. And the reason that I want to talk about depression today is because over the past year and a half or so, I've seen way too many pastors take their own life. This is something that uh, it, it gets overwhelming every time I read or hear of another pastor taking their own life. Some in recent years have been larger, well-known pastors, and some have not been well-known pastors. They've been just local pastors that grind it out week after week in their local context. And I just wanted to come on today and talk about depression, especially from the side of a pastor, because I see this, as I mentioned, too often nowadays where a pastor is taking his own life. But this doesn't have to be specific to pastors. This could be uh, helpful to anyone that struggles with depression. This could be helpful to anyone that struggles with anxiety, with panic attacks, things like that. So I want to bring a biblical perspective to depression. Now, depression is a real thing. There's, There's some people that will say, well, Uh, you just need to get over it, or you just need to be happy, or you just need more joy. Well, joy is not the absence of suffering and trials and pain and frustrations in this life. So don't let anybody tell you that you have to just, quote-unquote, get over it, or, quote-unquote, move on, or just change your mind or change your thinking. Some of these things are weighty that people deal with on a daily basis, and uh, in the last year and a half, two years, we've seen Jared Wilson, uh, a, a larger, uh, he's a well-known pastor, began, I believe, his uh, preaching ministry in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, moved out towards California area, and ultimately took his life after uh, many years of struggling with depression. Most recent pastor that you may have heard of is Darren Patrick. He was the pastor, he founded or planted, I believe it was Journey in St. Louis, was there for a time, had a fall, was spent a couple of years being restored, and uh, was working and serving in a ministry in Florida, and recently took his own life. And just as last week, and as recent as this week, I've heard of another pastor who was just a local pastor at a church. Uh, in the United States, and he died, and it was said that he took his own life. And, man, this happens all too often, and it's not just with pastors. It's with people in general, no matter who you are, no matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. People deal with and struggle with depression, and it is a real thing in our society. Now, we can't just say, well, only 
unbelievers deal with depression. No, we cannot say that because we know that believers and unbelievers alike do indeed deal with depression. As a matter of fact, Charles Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, battled severe depression his whole life. It was something that he dealt with. He uh, just moved through life dealing with severe depression. It was a part of who he was, even as a pastor. And we can bring it into a biblical perspective. If we look at the Bible, we see that there is depression in these many men and women that we find in Scripture. For, for instance, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, after God just defeated, he just watched this, right? His God, the God of the Bible, defeated the prophets of Baal. And then Jezebel finds out, and she says, well, I'm going to do to you and even more what happened to the prophets. So we see in 1 Kings chapter 19, 4, uh, Elijah just is wanting God to take his life. He's just ready to die, right? So we see this severe depression from Elijah, even after watching what God has just done before his eyes. Now he's getting a death threat sent his way, and all of a sudden he's ready to die. He's depressed. He's uh, finding himself pulling back from everybody. But we also see this in the life of David. If you read through the Psalms, you're going to see a man that is after God's own heart, but he is also a man that struggles with depression. We find many different Psalms in the Bible that are clearly showing the depression of David. So we cannot escape depression just because we're believers in Christ. We see, again, David considered a man after God's own heart, battled depression. So you may be battling depression as well, and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you are a believer. So we have to have a biblical response to depression. First of all, we have to acknowledge that depression is real and even within the Christian community. And we also see this In the scriptures, we see in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25, that says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. So if you know, uh, if you've been anxious at times, if you have been depressed, you know that it will weigh you down. It will suffocate you. It will hurt you. But then it says, but a good word makes him glad. So this is what I've been thinking through as I keep hearing over and over about pastors and even Christians and people that are taking their own life and we have to be we have to be loving and caring through this because I know people that are godly people that have struggled and contemplated taking their own lives and by the grace of God they're still here and then there are times that as we've seen uh, somebody gives in to the weight of this depression and temptation and they take their own life and This is something that we have to navigate as believers, and even as pastors, we have to navigate this because this could be a very real temptation for us in our depression is to take our own life, as well as it is for other people in our congregation or people that we may know that could give in to this temptation of taking their lives in the middle of depression. So we have to understand that anxiety is real, depression is real, we see it in the scriptures, we know that it's real, and then Jesus even... In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 20, uh, I'm sorry, 28 through 30, say this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We have to know that Jesus Christ is, will give us rest for our weary souls. So we have to understand that in our depression, we have a place that we can go. We can submit to the Lord. We can get in prayer. We can read his word, be obedient to his word, pray to the Lord. Uh, We can seek godly counsel, and we'll talk about those things here in just a minute, about uh, practical things that we can do if we're struggling with depression. But we have to see that God is the one that has given us Christ. Christ came to this earth. He lived a sinless, perfect life. And on the cross, he took the sins of many. And as a result, those that believe, that that repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will receive his righteousness. So that doesn't take away sin. 
at all. We know this just by reading Scripture, that we will not be perfected in Christ until we leave this earth or Jesus comes back, whichever happens first. So while we're still here, we're still going to struggle with sin. We're still going to struggle with depression. We're still going to struggle with sickness and death. So we are not escaping those things as we repent and believe and receive the righteousness of Christ. However, we do have an advocate, one that is for us and not against us. This is Christ that we can go to. This is Christ that we can submit ourselves to through the Word. We can go to the Lord in prayer and, again, seek godly counsel because, again, depression is real and it is weighty. And we have to be people, first of all, for our own selves, if we struggle with depression, we have to understand kind of a, a step-by-step checklist of things that we can do to help when we struggle with bouts of depression. So some of those things that we can do for ourselves, as, as well as as we go through this, keep in mind that these are a step-by-step checklist of things that you can do for yourself, but also keep in mind for other people that you may know that struggle with depression as well. So the first thing that we probably need to be able to do is to acknowledge that we do have a problem with depression. Now, I know sometimes our lives, the things that are going on in our minds and in our hearts, we don't really like to tell people what's going on. We don't like to put our lives out there on display for others to see and hear about. So that is going to be the toughest part because we cannot just keep depression to ourselves. I believe there comes a time where we have to reach out to godly counsel and seek wisdom from others. So I think that we first, even if we don't get to that point yet, we still have to acknowledge in our own hearts that we are struggling with depression because so easily I can dismiss the idea of going through a bout of depression simply because I want to justify it somehow and just say, well, I'm just busy right now and it's just kind of weighing me down or oh, I'm just stressed about this thing that's happening at the church or at work or whatever. I I, I could do those things and justify the depression, and really what I'm doing is suppressing that, making it worse. So I have to acknowledge, and if you are depressed or struggle with depression, I believe it's important for you to acknowledge as well that, yes, you do struggle with depression or uh, bouts of depression at least, maybe not a constant ongoing depression, but bouts of depression that come and go. I know depression manifests itself in different ways. So the first thing that we need to do, in my opinion, now, this is just my opinion. Let me go back and say that. These are my opinions, and you may be able to add some things to this or uh, take away some things. I'd love to hear from you on that, and I'll uh, hope to do so. First, we need to acknowledge we have a problem, and if we're a believer— The second thing we need to do is submit ourselves to the Lord. I've already kind of mentioned this already, but we need to submit ourselves to the Lord by going to the Scriptures. A lot of times we could divert ourselves and our attention to other things such as television, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube videos, things that aren't really going to help that we just try to band-aid for a few minutes and Uh, ultimately the depression we are still dealing with, right? So uh, we need to turn off all distractions and get in the Word of God, because if we're a believer, we always have some form of joy within us because we are saved people. So when we go to His Word, His Word is illuminated in our hearts, and it brings us more joy knowing that the God of the Bible is who He says He is, and he will do what he says he'll do. So we can find comfort in the Scriptures. So we run to the Scriptures, we submit our hearts and our lives to the Scriptures as we read, and then from there, I believe it's important that we pray back the Scriptures to God. And not only just pray back the Scriptures we read to God, we tell Him that we are struggling. Although God is omniscient, He knows everything that you're dealing with, He knows everything that's going on, He knows all of your thoughts before you even tell Him. It is important that we pray to God because He is our Father, our Heavenly Father, that we should be able to go to. And He expects us as His children to go to Him in prayer and to uh, give Him our worries, talk to Him about our worries and our struggles and our anxieties and our depression, because it is Him that ends up giving us rest through Christ. So we have to be able to submit to the Word 
and then pray back the word and then acknowledge our depression and anxiety to the Lord and seek that rest that his word promises us. So in these two things alone, I think when we struggle with these bouts of depression, these two things alone will help tremendously. It'll bring us to a place where we are coming out of that pit, where he is taking us out of that pit. And it is a beautiful thing to be able to go to the Lord through his word and in prayer. So we do that. And then I also think we need to seek wise biblical counsel, not worldly counsel. So what this looks like is you need to get some people in your life. It may just be one person, but you need to have that one person that you trust with your life. And I would say if you're married, that could and should be your spouse plus someone else that you could call. Sometimes we don't want to wake our spouses up in the middle of the night when we're sitting alone and struggling and and, and frustrated and the weight of the world is on us. Sometimes we just need to reach out to a brother or a sister in Christ over the telephone. And I want to encourage you to be that person for someone and also to find that person that you can text at 1 a.m. in the morning or you can call until they wake up at 1 a.m. in the morning just to be able to talk with somebody because you never know. If you don't reach out to somebody, you could still give in to the temptation of taking your life. Now, uh, Satan is still roaming this earth, so he is still tempting people. He is still seeking to kill, steal, and destroy. So these are real temptations that you can have in the middle of depression. So you need to have that brother or sister in Christ that you can call no matter what, no matter when, and just share everything that you're struggling with. And that person not hold it against you. That that person not think that you're strange. That person not think that you're weird for feeling the way you do or struggling the way you do. But you need to have that person that you can contact whenever you need to. Now, we also, I think it's important that we pinpoint the triggers that spark our anxiety or our depression. I have watched this television show before, and many of you have probably watched it as well. It's called The Office. There's an episode where one of the one of the guys, Stanley Hudson, has a heart attack, and they put him on this stress monitor that beeps constantly whenever something is stressing him out. So Michael Scott, the boss, stresses everybody out if you've ever watched the show. So he, the closer he gets to Stanley, the faster his little thing goes off. So Michael Scott is what was stressing Stanley out. Now, I know that's a TV show, and I use that as, that as an example, but Stanley was able to pinpoint what triggers his stress, anxiety, and uh, which led to his heart attack. So uh, those are the things that we need to pinpoint in our lives. Like, what is it in our life that causes us to feel anxious? What is it in our life that when it happens or when we hear it, it causes depression? So whatever those triggers may be, we need to start to try to identify them. And this is how a brother or sister in Christ could come alongside of you and help you identify those triggers. So identifying those triggers are going to be huge in trying to stay away from these bouts of anxiety and depression. Sometimes we can help it. Sometimes we can't. It may mean that you need to change your diet, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, but it may need to be a change of where you go, the people you see, the people you talk to. It may be Facebook or social media that triggers your anxiety, especially in this world we live in today. You can get on there and you can have your blood pressure raised in a a hot minute because of the things that you may see on social media, but some of these things may trigger anxiety in your life. Some of them may lead to depression, so maybe it's cutting out social media. Maybe you need to get rid of it. Maybe you need to reduce your friends list and the things that you do see. If it's news sources that you are following, maybe you need to unfollow those things and stick to more biblical things and being in certain groups that are going to be God glorifying and Christ exalting and encourage you in your walk with Christ. So there are many different things that we can look at that could potentially trigger anxiety and depression. So we need to pinpoint those things and try to stay away from those things or either cut them out of our lives all together. And I think that 
uh, we need to work on those things as we're doing it. So some, what I mean by that is it may be difficult for, for some of you to cut something out cold turkey, but you need to work at getting it gone. You need to take the steps necessary to get it gone. And the final thing that I would say, not the final thing, because I want to add something else to this here in just a second, but the final thing I would say in this checklist is there are times when you may need to see a doctor. And I know that this is a, a heavily debated topic on whether or not to take medicine for depression and anxiety, because we do have the scriptures, we have the Lord. And listen, there are times where we bring anxiety and depression on ourselves by maybe a sin pattern in our life, maybe some things that we do say, places we go, people we see. Uh, the things that we put into our life could bring that upon ourselves, and we just need to cut that out. And, and sometimes it's uh, so real, and it's sometimes hereditary that it's passed down through us and through our families, and uh, we just can't shake it sometimes. And there are times where I personally believe that you may need to go see a doctor. I believe there are such things as chemical imbalances and different things like that, and this is uh, not a debate right now. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you're listening, do you think it's okay to uh, take medicine for anxiety and depression? Uh, please tell me your thoughts. I'd love that. Uh, but it's okay, in my opinion, sometimes that you may need to see this doctor to be put on medication simply because we will go to the doctor for everything. If our liver's messing up, if our heart's messing up, if our kidneys are messing up, we want to be at the doctor to get the medicine that the doctors can give us to help right the problem in our lives and help get our organs functioning correctly. Well, when it comes to the brain and we think about chemical imbalances and things that are passed down through the generations that you may receive, uh, the, the brain is also an organ. So if we would like for our heart to function correctly and something happens and there's an irregular heartbeat or some other abnormality there, we want to take the medicine to fix that. So sometimes I think it's necessary for people, whether believer or unbeliever, to go to a doctor and get regulated on some sort of medicine because the brain as well as the heart is both an organ that we want to function correctly. And we all know people, you may be someone that when it's not correct, when it's not functioning correctly, you could be a dangerous person, you could be a, uh, you could be a danger to yourself, to others, you could be erratic and uh, it's important that we understand ourselves, our bodies. We understand when we need to see the doctor, and we need not have shame in seeing a doctor for depression. I, I don't know. I didn't look up any statistics, but I'm willing to bet there is a large percentage of the population of the world that struggle with anxiety and depression. Now, when we're believers, we do have these other options. That I don't even think they're options. I think that we should... Uh, they should be mandated, and, and, and probably uh, rightfully so, as a believer, you need to acknowledge it and then get in the Word and in prayer and pray that God would change your thinking, change your thoughts, your attitude, all of these things. But then still, at the end of the day, it may be beneficial to talk to a doctor to see exactly what's going on. So I also uh, want you to know, and I mentioned it, but just don't have any shame when that happens. Tell your person that is the person that you can talk to about anything. Say, hey, I'm going to the doctor. Uh, have them go with you if you'd like. Uh, tell your people that you want to know, and that has to be it. Nobody else has to know if you have to end up taking medicine or not. So don't be ashamed to do that, especially when it comes to your life. If you get in such a bad place where you're tempted to take your own life, I would much rather you be taking a pill for your brain than have to speak at your funeral. I'd much rather someone call me at one o'clock in the morning than their spouse or a friend call me and say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? They took their own life last night. Sometimes this is a hard subject to deal with, and it makes me wonder why pastors in general can't come over this knowing the Word of God, knowing what they should do. Why are they tempted to take their own life? It is a tragic thing, and not only pastors, it's tragic when anybody takes their life. What's most tragic to me is when an unbeliever takes their life because it means that they are receiving the wrath of God in eternity. And that is troubling. It's saddening to me when an unbeliever dies at, at all, whether it's by suicide or, 
or any other reason, but especially for a believer, we have tools that we, everybody has the tools. Everybody, unbelievers can go to the doctor. Unbelievers can go get counseling. Unbelievers can confide in somebody, right? But we have a biblical worldview to confide in. We need each other. A community of believers is how we should function. In, a, in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. So I think we need people in our lives teaching us the Word of God, encouraging us, admonishing us. And when we're struggling to help us, to be there for us and to be there with us. And if that's you, tempt, tempted to take your own life, please reach out to me. Reach out to somebody. Doctrine Matters Podcast at gmail.com. Reach out to me and let me know. We'll exchange phone numbers. If I have to drive to where you are, if you're on the other side of the world, I will come be that person to help you. Or either I'll put you in contact with somebody that will. But I would not want anyone to take their own life when there is not life that needs to be taken. There's so much more that we can live for. And then we can get into the debate where we say, well, are, are people that commit suicide, are they in hell? And I would say the Bible doesn't teach that. This is a sin, a temptation that has led to an ultimate consequence. Now, I don't believe that people that take their life are in hell unless they are an unbeliever. You can say, well, true believers would never do this, would they? Well, true believers also do some pretty egregious things at times because we live in a fallen world. They uh, get drunk. They have affairs. They uh, do sinful things because we live in a sinful world. So I don't want to have the debate on whether or not this is uh, going to cast them into hell because true believers everywhere still struggle with sin, and this is sin. It's an ultimate sin with an ultimate consequence that affects a lot more people than just them. However, we cannot firmly say that what they have done has sent them to hell because if they're a believer, I believe the Bible is true, that they have just entered into eternity with the Lord Jesus. And uh, that's a, another debate later on down the line, if that's something that anybody would care to talk through more thoroughly. But I want to make it clear, in my opinion, I don't believe that if you commit suicide that you go to hell automatically. And what I'm now saying is, do not let that be a license or a justification for you to take your own life. Again, if you are contemplating this, if you're struggling, please reach out to the Doctrine Matters Podcast at doctrinematterspodcast at gmail.com, and we will help you through anything that you're struggling with. So to recap, acknowledge that you have a depression problem, anxiety. Submit to the Lord through the scriptures and through prayer. Seek wise counsel, biblical counsel, that is going to give you counsel from a Christian worldview and pinpoint these triggers that trigger this anxiety and depression. Work on those things. See a doctor if need be. Now, here is something else that I believe that I would like to add in here as we end our time together talking about this issue. One of the greatest things that we can do other than submitting to the Lord through the Scripture and in prayer is Have a healthy diet and exercise. Now, I know we probably get tired of hearing diet and exercise. If you're like me, diets are horrible sometimes because it's almost like working on your credit. You can ruin your credit really quickly, but it takes so long to build it back up. It's kind of like a diet. You can take little time destroying your body, and it takes so long and so much work to get it back into shape. So, One of the things that really helps me, and I love to go to the gym, there's something about pushing around something heavy that I just really love, and and it just helps me mentally, physically, emotionally, but I love going to the gym, and I try not to overeat, I try not to eat junk, I try to drink more water than I do soft drinks, and that really does something to you when you treat your body in such a way that you're not just feeding it junk. You're not just laying around watching TV and just getting, uh, adding weight and weight and weight to your body. Uh, there's something to be said about diet and exercise. I do believe it's tied to 
mental and physical health that will help in your bouts of depression and anxiety. So I want to encourage you. So, so many of you may listen now and say, well, I can't go to the gym and throw around a lot of weight. You don't have to do that to exercise. If you, let's just say that there's a person that is really overweight listening today. One of the best things that you can start doing is to get up and take a walk down your street and back. Walk until you're like, okay, I'm done. I'm back. It just If that's just a quarter of a mile, that's a quarter of a mile more than you did yesterday, right? So if you keep doing that, you keep walking, then you will start to feel better. You will start to have this emotional health. Your mental state will be much better. And then you also, I would encourage you to couple that with not eating a bunch of junk, eating vegetables, not eating a lot, you know, no, don't overeat. And watch what you're eating, your sugar intakes, your your fats and all those things. Be careful. And I know that that's a struggle sometimes when you're when you're going from just feeding your face with whatever you want whenever you want it to really kind of being mindful of that, but I'm telling you it works if you will be um serious about a diet and exercise. And even if you don't want to do the diet part first, do the exercise. I watched a, a man when I was growing up come around our neighborhood. I could see if he walked. I'd see him walk by in front of my house once, and he was a, a bigger man. And then the next day, I saw him again. The next day, he walked past again. Next day, again. I had no idea where this guy lived in the neighborhood, but I see him every single day. The next day, pouring down rain. He's got on a rain suit walking. He comes by the house. Uh, cold. He's walking, coming by the house all in his uh, winter's best as far as his clothes. It doesn't matter what was going on during the day. No matter what the weather was, I would see him. And eventually, I would see him two times. He'd come by my house. Then three times in the same day. And I watched this man change from being obese to being a, a, a really fit man because he put in the work and disciplined himself to get out and walk the neighborhood. That's all I ever see. I never saw him run. I never saw him do anything else. Walked. He made a, a point to walk every single day, no matter what. And you could see the change in this man over time. And it didn't take long to start changing. So if you would just get out of the house and do some sort of exercise, and you may say, well, I don't really want to get out of the house and walk right now because I don't feel like I can walk very far. Well, do it in your house. Stand up, do some squats, air squats. You don't even need weight. Uh, walk around the house more. Uh, find something to do to get your heart rate up and be active because it is specifically tied to health physically and I also believe emotionally and mentally as well. So uh, there's a little added bonus for you. If you have feeling depressed and, and uh, an anxious, submit to the Lord. And uh, also focus on what you're eating and uh, the exercise that you're doing. So, or not doing. If you're not doing anything, please start. You'll, you'll see a difference, I promise you. Again, let me just say this. I'm not a doctor. I, I don't even have a doctorate in ministry or theology. Listen, I'm just an unschooled, ordinary man, as the Bible talks about. So don't take any of this as uh, medical advice. I just want to bring this to you from a personal level and things that I've read. And, and I know that the diet and exercise really helps with my emotional and mental state. And uh, I want to bring these things from a biblical perspective. So I'm not a licensed doctor in any way. So uh, take that for what it's worth. But please, if you are struggling with depression, anxiety, reach out to someone, reach out to me, uh, leave a comment if you need to, uh, email me again, doctrine matters podcast at gmail.com. It will come straight to my phone, my computer. I will see it. So please reach out to someone. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, if there are some things that you would add to the list of things that uh, we could do to help in this time of uh, anxiety and depression when we when we feel this wave, uh, reach out, put, leave a comment, send an email. What are some things that we could do? Uh, anything other than what I've talked about. But listen, I would like for it to be biblical. Uh, I don't want to be outside of a Christian worldview. Uh, but if there are things that uh, you would add to this, please feel free to let me know. I would love to add it to my list. And uh, as we close today, just remember, 
that if you are in Christ, we have joy. We have a future glory that awaits us. We will experience trials and suffering on this side of eternity, but the Bible teaches us that they pale in comparison to the glory that we will receive. I believe it's Romans 8, 18. So keep that in mind. You, we will suffer. We will have trials, but find joy as we rest and submit ourselves to Christ. I look forward to talking with you again real soon. I hope you have a great rest of your day today, and God bless.